so I, I start I start uh, 15 minutes late. Sorry, uh, I, uh, this is not the, the title of the talk, but uh, w of my talk. But I realized that that I should give uh, an introduction before, and I'm going to go over a few slides on this, and then go to what I wa wanted to show before. So I'm going to f uh, talk about data simulation, and we had a, a nice introduction to data simulation by Michael Gill on, on the first day, and I'm going to give another introduction to data simulation. Uh, and, and then show what I wanted to talk about is a few <laughs> uh, advances uh, on, on data simulation that, that actually were originally my ideas, and we developed them, and they work to show that we can constantly uh, improve things if we if we apply this. Sorry for for bragging. Okay. So uh, what first uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what what uh, George said that that uh, numerical weather prediction has been improving remarkably, and and this is the the difference of the six hour forecast <coughs> and the. Uh, uh, and, and the observational heights at 500 millibars uh, uh, in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere in, in NSEP and and you can uh, uh, this shows how the 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 six hour forecast which is used in the in the data simulation analysis cycle uh, shows that that the the six hour forecast is agreeing much, much better with the actual observations now than it used to be. And it's only surprising it was so bad in the past. What, 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 what is persistence of this? Uh persistence is, is uh, around here. Okay. And this is a very famous uh, uh, <coughs> and nice looking uh, picture as usual that that made by the European Center and and it shows the the uh, correlation between uh, called anomaly correlation between the the uh, forecast and the actual verification for day three five seven and ten and the correlation obviously decreases with time with the uh, the length of the forecast still uh, uh, it, the, the, the top line is, is the northern hemisphere and, and the bottom line is the southern hemisphere. And it used to be that the northern hemisphere was much better than the southern hemisphere. And now, as I showed in the previous picture, they are com comparable. But this is a, a, a constant uh, Im, Im improvement. But we are not going to continue. Uh, we are not going to be able to beat Lorenz and, and go beyond uh, uh, two weeks or so, uh, but but it's it's a, as as George said, it's a real triumph of science, and I I think people don't realize what an incredible triumph of science it is, because it improves slowly. So it's like the frogs that are in warming water. People don't realize that that it's improving, but but it's it's a remarkable improvement and. It gives me great happiness <laughs> to be able to work on uh, to be able to work on something which is immediately uh, useful for mankind, and and uh, even though nobody notices the difference, but but it improves. <coughs> and this is another interesting figure that shows uh, the the op uh, the improvement of the operational forecast and. And uh, and this constant line is what uh, what happens if we use what we uh, di a, f a frozen system that was developed in 1994. So the improvement usually people think the improved forecasts are due to satellite data, and that certainly is is, is uh, helps to have the satellite data. But the real improvement is uh, is th are the methods that are used even even uh, with adding the satellite data, we don't see any, imp any uh, improvement when the 
when the methodology doesn't change with time. OK, so uh, I would like to uh, uh, remind you what Michael showed. Uh, Michael showed this toy example one, and I'm going to show two examples, uh, this one and, and uh, Michael uh, mentioned if we have a forecast, which we call BIB for background, because the, the observations cannot fill up the, the model. So we need a background, which is a first guess or a, fork, a forecast. So B stands for forecast. So we have a forecast and an observation. And, and this is just a scalar equation. And, and the f the what we call analysis which is our best estimate of the truth, is the forecast ma pl uh, plus this, this term, which is the observation minus the forecast. And this is called innovation because this is the new information that we get after we make the forecast, multiplied by an optimal coefficient or Kalman uh, uh, gain, which is the error variance of the forecast divided by the total error variance. So this is the fundamental equation that's used in data simulation. And this is another beautiful uh, uh, equation that Michael also showed that shows that the analysis uh, precision, we could call or accuracy, the inverse of the uh, 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 analysis error variance is the sum of the the uh, precision o obtained or the information obtained from the forecast plus the observation. <coughs> so the analysis error is if you are doing the right statistics, if your assumptions, statistical assumptions are right, uh, we increase the precision by, by combining the information from the forecast and the information from the observation. So if the statistics are r r exact and if the coefficients are optimal, then the precision of the analysis, the inverse of the variance, is the sum of the precisions. So now let me talk about uh, a, a second toy ex ex uh, experiment, which is much more, more uh, realistic uh, than realistic than the 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 number one. So suppose that we have uh, an object, a, a, a stone in space, and we are interested in, in knowing the temperature of that stone in, in space. So we want to know the temperature accurately, but we don't measure the temperature. We, we measure the radiance that it emits. So we have an observation. Uh, so the, the temperature is in degree Kelvin, and the radiance is in watt per meter square. So we need an observation model that converts from radiance to temperature. So the, the observation model is usually <coughs> called age of the temperature. And, and it's basically the Stefan Boltzmann equation, sigma uh, constant times t to the fourth. So uh, that's one element that we have in data simulation. If you have typically <laughs> We, you may have observations of the same variables as the model, or observations like satellite observations that are radiances and not. So you need something to convert, and that's the observation model. So we also have a forecast model for the temperature in order to. We we always need some forecast model. So we we can, for example, uh, use a very simple model that says that the temperature at the following time step is equal to the temperature at the current time step plus delta t times the solar uh, the, the the short wave uh, from the sun heating and the long wave cooling from emission so this is a, a gives us a first ge a guess or background of of the estimation of of the temperature change and the i'm not going to go over everything here but the, the beautiful thing about this is that we can derive all the data simulation equations, <coughs> optimal interpolation, Kalman filter, and variation 
for this toy system and it's completely easy to understand and then we can uh, compare it of the, this toy number example two with a real huge huge vector matrix equations and and they are identical and and see if you understood the toy system then you understand perfectly well the the, the complex system but I'm not going to go through that so uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and change to yeah. Maybe you, can, you can close this. You have finished with this one? Or oh, uh, sorry. If, if you finish it, you can yeah, clo yeah, close yeah. it directly. Okay. And, and then this, okay, and then yeah. it was this one. So I am going to assume that you understood, understood what I said and, and get the basic idea of data assimilation, and now I'm going to to give a talk that I gave at a, a, a meeting of data assimilation experts, so I, I apologize if I don't, I'm not clear enough. Uh, I am very grateful to my former students uh, that have done in incredible work, uh, and uh, I, I also want to thank very much uh, the Weather and Chaos group, which is now directed by, by uh, Cayo Ide, and I particularly want to thank uh, Brian Hunt, who is uh, our local genius and, and has uh, helped us develop very beautiful uh, uh, methods. So th this is the title of my talk, Running in Place, Assimilation of Rain and Ensemble Forecast Sensitivity. So, so these are, if I have enough time, three, three examples of how we can improve things. So, uh, uh, I, I'm going to, to, let me skip this, so, sorry, I, I, <laughs> I was planning to prepare very carefully this talk and then we went to that beautiful calle, callejoneada last night and, and instead I went back went to, to sleep instead of working. <laughs> but I am very grateful that for that uh, incredible great time that we had yesterday. It was the, I've never in my life seen anything so, so nice. So I'm going to talk, uh, first uh, uh, I'm going to discuss something that uh, we call local ensemble transform Kalman filter which we think is the best <laughs> data simulation sc scheme that, that, that there is uh, among all the ensemble common filters. And then and, and I'm going to talk about a method which we call running in place, in which we extract more information of observation by using them more than once. And using observations more than once is a very uh, immoral and, and sinful thing uh, according to many people in data simulation and, and so for example we had long fights before it was published but I, I'll show you why it, uh, it works very well and, and, and how it works well, very well. Linear system it, it's for a linear, linear system no, for a linear system it's by definition useless. I mean the definition of the common filter is that it is contract all the information that it's for non still still I, I, I I'm going to say that thank you for saying it before me but uh, 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 even people like like uh, Jeff Anderson finally was convinced but but he had a, a lot of difficulties uh, accepting this <coughs> and actually there was somebody else called Sakov that made us go through four iterations and then after the fourth iteration he rejected it and said I have a bet much better method. So, <laughs> so it, it was a, a difficult thing to show. And I'm going to show uh, uh, the how it works and, and actually r applications to real data, to the uh, forecast of the typhoons in LACU and, the, and to seven years of ocean reanalysis. <coughs> 
And the other, uh, another example of, of uh, uh, improvements that we make are is effective assimilation of precipitation. We, uh, precipitation, as, as you have seen and as you know, is, is with temperature the most important and sensitive uh, variable that, that we are all interested in. And, and we measure precipitation in many, many ways, for example, with, with gauges. And we, we would like to use them as observations. And it has been done for 30 years, and it has not succeeded uh, in the sense that, that uh, uh, assimilation of precipitation has generally failed to improve forecast beyond a few hours. And so we, we uh, developed a new approach that uh, promises to, to succeed. And uh, finally, uh, I'm going to talk about forecast sensitivity to observations and a proactive quality control that, that we, we, we are... De and, and okay, so let me start from the beginning. What, what is the local ensemble transform Kalman filter? So we, we start, the, uh, we, call, we put it, we like to put it, or students put it uh, the first time <laughs> as, as a black box, because uh, it, uh, amazingly, the, you, you don't need to know the inside, it, it just accepts uh, ensemble observations and real observations, and then produces ensemble analysis. And the ensemble analysis are the initial conditions for the model. So we produce ensemble forecast with this. And we use this observation operator that I mentioned. And the observation operator, then after you make the forecast, the observation operator says what the forecast of the observations would be in, the, in an ensemble. And that's given to the LTKF together with the real observations. And and uh, it, it gives you the analysis and goes on like this. So it's model independent. And this is very important because the other advanced method that has been very successful at ECMWF and, and many other centers is called 4 d bar, And it's incredibly complex and <laughs> complicated. Uh, and you need to do uh, uh, the linear tangent model, the adjoint model, and, and it's a, a mess. Whereas this, you, it doesn't really care what the model is. It, you just give it these two inputs, and it gives you the, the initial conditions. So the, uh, unlike other Kalman filters, ensemble Kalman filters, we assimilate the observations simultaneously. It's completely parallel, no adjoint needed, and it can be done in, in in four dimensions as, as 4D bar, and it, uh, we will see that it computes the weights for the ensemble forecast explicitly. And uh, I'll, I'll don't worry if you didn't understand what I was talking about. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll is that done once per time, in, in a given forecast time? Yeah. No, for example, Typically, the, the analysis cycle is six <coughs> hours, so it's done four times a day. Okay. But the for... The loop is not done repeatedly for a given forecast? It's no, it's, it's done only once, yeah. But in running in place, we actually do the loop several times. So, uh, thank you for the question. So, so uh, uh, we... Uh, the sup uh, this, this is a, a schematic of a model, and you have observations that are the diamonds. So uh, at each grid point, the analysis is done independently of anybody else. So that's why it's very parallel. And uh, the question is, how, how do we uh, choose this? And uh, we, we cannot use all the observations, because the most important uh, component, perhaps, is, is the, the error covariance from, from the ensemble come and filter from, from the ensemble. So, sorry, let, let, me, let me say this uh, uh, again. Suppose that, that this is my ensemble. And what, uh, what we would like to know is the forecast error covariance of, of, of the forecast. And we cannot get it. But 
what we do is, is take the mean and assume that the mean is the best estimate of, of, the, of, of, of the truth. And then we estimate the forecast error covariance by from, from the ensemble members, the distance with the, uh, the mean, how they are correlated. So we cannot uh, uh, use observ uh, observations that are too far because, because uh, uh, the, the, the observations that are too far uh, uh, are, are will introduce uh, covariances that are, are, are that have sampling errors. So we need to do something which is called <coughs> localization. And uh, in our system, the localization is done uh, choosing the the observations that we are going to use in this particular. So in this particular uh, grid point. So we choose the observations that we are going to use here. We don't use the observations that are far away because we feel, uh, and, and it's true, that, that for the information that they give, they introduce more sampling errors, so it's not worth doing. So all the observations uh, are, are within the local regions are, are assimilated simultaneously. And now I'm going to describe the algorithm in a single slide, and it's going to be my equations to show uh, one, one of my equations slides to show that we also do mathematics. And I, s I like to say, to show that this can be described in a single slide, because if you do for the bar, which is our competitor, that, that's hundreds of, of pages of equations. Uh, so, the, uh, this is the LETKF, so it, it has a forecast step, uh, and uh, I should say, I learned the, the f my, my first steps in data simulation, I learned from Michael Gill, so I'm forever grateful for that. But, so we have the forecast step, and uh, X is, is a huge long vector of the state of the model. And if it says B, it's a forecast. It's, if it says A, it's an analysis. So we, we take the analysis in the previous time step for each ensemble member, and the ensemble member is uh, uh, labeled by K. So for each ensemble member, we make a forecast starting from the previous analysis, and we make the forecast. And then, uh, uh, for the analysis step, we construct a matrix of uh, perturbations, which is the, this long vector e uh, x, the fir one, the first ensemble member, minus the mean, and this is an estimation of the error. So we, we do it for all ensemble members, and we also do the same for the observation. So we first convert the model forecast, we use the observation operator to convert it in observations made by the forecast. So these are not really observations, but are forecast observations because I'm putting a background there letter. And then we construct also a perturbation matrix, which is the difference between these two. So this is done globally, and it's very simple. And, and locally, we choose for each grid point the observations to be used and compute the local analysis error covariance and perturbations in ensemble space. So, and here uh, it's the genius of, of Brian Hunt that uh, uh, developed, uh, 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 well, uh, it's, it's, it's why ensemble gamma filter works, but in particular it's done very elegantly here. So it, this equation says that P, uh, the error covariance matrix for the analysis to the, to the minus one, suppose that I put the minus one on the other side, is equal to the sum of the, so the, the information or accuracy or precision of the, the analysis error covariance is equal to the sum of the observation error covariance and the and the background error covariance because it's done in ensemble space. So in ensemble space, the, 
the background error covariance is the, ident is pro is the identity and, and we this is the observation error covariance to the minus one, this is the background error covariance to the minus one and that gives the PA to the minus one. So we can compute uh, the, the big difficult part which is the analysis error covariance uh, exactly using the Kalman filter equations. And then we compute weights. Uh, and again, if this is the ensemble uh, system, the analysis will, will be a linear combination of, of this uh, forecast. So it's in, in the subspace of the forecast. And what, we ne what, what this uh, LTKF does is compute the weights that multiply each of the ensemble members explicitly and that allows us to do all sorts of additional things. <coughs> so we this is simply the square root uh, and the symmetric square root in particular of, of this, this equation and we also compute weights for the in improvement uh, coming from the innovation. This is the observations in the real observations and these are the observations estimated by the forecast and this gives the, the weights uh, for each ensemble member to, to correct for this. So the, then once we do that we are done. The, the new ensemble analysis are, are given by the, uh, the, the new ensemble uh, perturbation matrix for the analysis is, is given by the forecast perturbation analysis times the weights plus the mean value and one, once we do that at every grid point we put together the new analysis ensemble and we are done. So maybe you didn't <laughs> understand the word of what I said but believe me uh, uh, it's very short and, and sweet compared to, to other methods. So now I, I'm going to show a uh, an idea that I have based on the, on the ideas of, of uh, uh, Brian Hunt. Uh, and this, is a, a, this represents the, a, an, as, an assimilation window, for example, six hours. And this, uh, two, uh, this is the analysis. This is an ensemble which is schematically represented by just two members, but in reality there are like 50 members in practice. So these two ensemble members start from the analysis and after six hours you get this and after six hours starting from this analysis uh, uh, ensemble mem analysis ensemble member uh, you get to this point. And uh <coughs> the, the st the, these uh, stars are, are the observations and for example if you have satellite observations uh, they are distributed in time, they are not uh, every six hours. Although ray winds are every six hours or most frequently every 12 hours. But, but we normally are, are the most, imp uh, 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 satellite data which is continuous is, is all the time there. So uh, the, at this time, at the previous analysis, we used all the previous observations to get the, uh, uh, the best estimate of, sorry, the best estimate of the analysis and that's the ensemble mean. So at the previous time, knowing all only the past observations, our, our estimate of the truth was the ensemble mean. It, it, it's in, this, in the middle of these two. But then we have these observations. So at this time, at the end of the six hours, let's say, uh, our analysis is going to be given influenced by the observations and for example it will give more weight to this ensemble member than to this because the observations are closer. So at the end of the window we we have a new an, a new ensemble analysis the, which is closer together because the the errors are are smaller and the ensemble mean is 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 this. Now the it it, it, uh, uh, I'm not going to repeat his argument, but the, the, 
weights that we have obtain, obtained here, which are higher, for example, maybe this was 0.8 and this was only 0.2. These weights are valid not only here, after assimilating all these observations, but throughout the analysis window. So it occurred to me that we could use that to information <coughs> that we have here, which are the weights that we should give 0.8 for this and 0.2 for this, we could use it here and obtain a better estimate of the, the truth here. And this is what we call uh, running in place. And a simpler version is called quasi-outer loop. So uh, if, if we obtain this, this uh, new est est better estimate of the analysis, because the previous estimate was just the mean between these two values in the center, but now we, we know the truth is, is should be closer to this. So we can use uh, running in place for faster spin up and use future data in reanalysis and, and we can deal with non-linear perturbations as Michael hinted. So we, uh, we first tested it with a quasi geotrophic model and, and basically the, f the formula is here. Uh, we, we first do the regular LTKF analysis at, at time n and obtain the weights uh, valid at time n and then we apply them at time n minus 1, the, the new weights, and then we repeat the, the analysis the second time. So that's what... what yeah. And first we checked whether it works and, and it does work and, and we got a, a, a better and when you do things before the final time, for reasons that I still don't understand, that's called a smoother. So we, we have a, a, a smoother that allows us, yeah, we have a smoother that allows us to say what these observations imply about the initial conditions. And we call it no cost, and it's actually no cost, no equations, essentially. <laughs> So, uh, which is quite remarkable because uh, uh, if you read uh, an article on smoothers, you, you have gazillions of equations. Anyway, uh, uh, we, we found that the smoother has errors which are always smaller than, than the original analysis. And uh, we, this is the RMS error depending on, uh, as a function of time during the analysis cycle. And you can see that we start with co totally random initial conditions and the ans LTKF manages to get the, the black line, which is very good, and the smoother uh, improves it a little bit more. And this is called the spin, spin up. So uh, it allows assimilation of future data and assimilating data f more than once. And we, we tried, uh, we tried also uh, compare, compare the 4 bar, which is the variational approach, and LTKF uh, with the Lorentz model. And we found that if we took a, a window for data assimilation that was short, so linear, the basically they gave the same results. But if we took a, a window that was long, and also if we applied all the tricks available to improve for the bar, like uh, the quasi QBA of, of uh, Talagrand and Pires, we, we were able to get 0.53 error for, for 25 steps, but and with uh, applying <coughs> all our tricks before uh, to this uh, got us 0.66. So I was heartbroken because it seemed like like uh, for the bar was better than than, ans than our LTKF. Then we applied uh, 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 the quasi outer loop where we only recompute the mean, not the per all the perturbations, and we got this result. Uh, and then we applied uh, running in place uh, uh, and we got really spectacular results. Uh, um, uh, it's, we, 
So running in place uh, smooths both the analysis and the analysis error covariance and iterates uh, and knows. And then we try we tried it uh, we tried it with the, the data simulation with the quasi geotrophic model and if we start with totally stupid random initial conditions with very large errors that are uh, distributed uniformly, not even Gaussian, we find that the LETKF takes a long time before it develops the dynamics of the system and, and finds the perturbations that are associated with the real dynamical errors. And after this time, it, it, it uh, the, the, does the spin down very quickly. But, uh, for example, <coughs> for the bar is the line in blue. Uh, and given some a priori information, it converges much, much faster than, than this. And this is a very serious problem. And actually, I started thinking about this because uh, a guy from Oklahoma asked me what to do. He said, the, our ensemble common filter is better than 4 bar after a long time, but, but it takes a long time and we are trying to predict tornadoes and by the time <laughs> it, it has uh, spun up, the tornado is gone, so it's not very helpful. So uh, I, I developed this to, to help him and we see that if we do running in time, it, it, it is without giving the system any, inform any a priori information about the previous state of the system, you can, in, in real time, uh, uh, go converge even faster than 4 d bar. And uh, we, we had a lot of difficulties uh, publishing a couple of papers, one in quarterly journal and in 2010 and one in monthly weather review in 2012. And uh, because it, it was difficult to, to understand why it works. So uh, again, this was, uh, we, we show why it works in a linear system. In a linear system, as Michael rightly pointed out, you don't need to, to use the observations more than once because the Kalman filter in a linear system has a forecast system, a forecast ensemble which is Gaussianly distributed. Then, if the forecast is linear, the um, you have an analysis which is Gaussian. Then you make a forecast, and if the forecast is linear, it's still Gaussian. Then you have the observations that are assumed to be Gaussian, and then the, you get the analysis. So what what we found. This is, uh, 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 and why would the observation, using the observations more than once, allow you to get the right solution? It seems uh, like the, if you use the observations twice, you are it's like assuming that the observation errors are, are uh, error variance is divided by two. If you use it n times, it's divided by n. So you should get the wrong the wrong results, but we do get the right results e even in, an in a linear model. So the solution of this linear model is zero, and Kalman filter is shown in red, and we if we make uh, two iterations or ten iterations of the, the, the uh, running in place, we, we get the, the, the black and, and, and blue uh, lines. And you can see uh, that the only time in which you get large differences at the beginning when the spin up is much faster. So uh, running in place converges to the regular optimal Kalman filter solution because the Kalman filter is so intelligent that, that uh, it realizes that, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, you are using the observations more than once, so you are uh, 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 re dividing the variance by n, and it also realizes that the forecast is more accurate proportionally, and so it compensates and you get the same solution. 
and now uh, a real ap application of real data. This is a typhoon in Laku that took place in 2008, and there were a lot of <coughs> observations, uh, drop zones, uh, which are railway zones dropped by the by the flight, and. Uh <coughs> uh the, they didn't find an improvement in the forecast when they used these observations. And actually, my, my f uh, former student, Professor Xu uh, Chi Yang at NCU Taiwan, when she tried uh, LTKF, she, she got a, a, a large error. Here is where the, these additional observations are observed. And, and the, these are limited number of observations are, and are incredibly valuable. So she tried LTKF running in place, and when she did that, she got a result which was much, much closer to the, to the real uh, <coughs> typhoon track, which is in, in black. So she go, when she used the LTKF in the standard way, she got this result. When she used the observations more than once, she got this result. So it, it works in, in real cases, and actually, uh, let me skip this, this slide. And I'm going to show another application to real data. And <laughs> it's a lot of real data because it's a, a, a seven-year seven uh, ocean data simulation. Seven-year ocean data simulation using the MAM2 model and, and the LTKF with RIP and, and also other uh, methods. Uh, 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 optimal interpolation and using the MAM2 model. And what, uh, what uh, this is shows is seven years of ocean reanalysis. It started in January 98 and ended in January 2004. And these are what we call usually errors, but are really root mean square differences between the forecast and the used in the background and, and, the, and the observations. And so uh, to, to <coughs> compare, we have a free run that doesn't use op, uh, uh, observations. And then we have, uh, uh, let me just talk about the SODA, which is optimal interpolation, a little bit uh, older method. And the, the green, the B is the background or the forecast, and the, the A is an, the analysis. So this, this is the forecast, and this is the analysis with optimal interpolation. And it, it's a very well-respected uh, uh, data simulation system. And, and then we try the LTKF, but adding running in place, and here the the forecast and the analysis are almost indistinguishable. So that means that the forecast is, is quite good because the observations don't change it too much. And, and when I saw this figure, I was <laughs> very happy <laughs> because this shows a, an incredible, nice, positive impact compared to the optimal interpolation method. And when we compare the salinity, also uh, the the, the salinity is, is here. There were, uh, very, there were very few measurements of salinities until the, uh, the buoys, uh, the Argov buoys uh, were introduced. And then the, 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 the number of s uh, the, the salinity measurements increased a lot. But even when there were few uh, salinities, the, the LTKF with running in place was <coughs> able to get a good result. So this, w this is encouraging. So uh, I'll, I'll skip this. So Kalm Kalman filter is optimal for a linear perfect model, actually. No, uh, during spin up or when the ensemble perturbations grow non linearly, ensemble Kalman filter is not optimal since it cannot extract enough information from the observation. So, because it's non-linear, as, as Michael pointed out. So the LTKF, a no-cost smoother or uh, 
uh, equivalent, it, it has uh, can be applied. Uh, sorry, it allows LTKF RIP to use the observations more than once, and thus, when when the Kalman filter is not optimal, then it doesn't make sense to say, oh, I use the observation and throw it away because that's what the rules say. When when the Kalman filter is not optimal, then you should use the observations more than once because you have not extracted all the, observ the information from, from them. So uh, this shortens the spin up and produces more accurate forecast with the same observations. For linear model running in place converges to the same optimal Kalman filter solution, but with the spread reduced by square root of n. So for long windows and nonlinear perturbations, running in place advances in, in smaller steps and approaches the true attractor more softly. So one can think by using the observation several times, if, if, the, if the attractor is, is, is changing a big deal during that period, we improve it slowly and, and softly, and, and that, that's, that's better. OK, may, maybe, yeah. I'll talk now about effective assimilation of precipitation. Yeah, uh, assimilation of precipitation has been done by changing. So if you, there are hundreds or thousands of articles about how to assimilate precipitation. And basically, what, what people say is, uh, is we have to force the model to rain as observed. So we, we take a model column, and then we we change the moisture to make it rain more or less, depending on whether the observation says that it rained more or less than the model. So the way it's done is, is changing the moisture and sometimes the temperature as well. So uh, this method is, uh, is very successful during the assimilation. So for example, we did in, in NSEP, uh, or a North America regional reanalysis, which where the model was nudged, uh, uh, forced by changes in moisture to, to rain as observed. And indeed, during the assimilation, the precipitation was identical to, to the observations, which, which had many advantages. But the model forgets about the changes as soon as the assimilation stops. So. Uh, why is that? Because it, uh, changing the moisture doesn't change the dynamics. As, as uh, uh, Roberto Mechoso mentioned, the, the potential vorticity is, is, is the real dynamical variable that the, the model remembers. So we have to change the, the potential vorticity. So the model will remember the changes. When when, when we make the model rain as observed during the assimilation, when the observations of rain go in, perfect, you get perfect agreement. But as soon as, as you make a, a forecast, it goes back to the, what it wanted to do before the, previous, the, sol the real solution. So what we want to do is, is, is change the potential vorticity, not, not the moisture. So ensemble common filters should modify potential vorticity efficiently because the analysis weights will be larger for a member that, that's raining more correctly because it has a potential vorticity which is better. So suppose that I have this uh, ensemble uh, here and, and this ensemble member is, is raining better than, than these others. So we are going to give it more weight from, from because the precipitation agrees with the observation better. And then that means that everybody else's uh, potential vorticity will become closer to this one, which has it better. So it's an ensemble common filter in principle should modify potential vorticity efficiently. But uh, five years ago, with Takemasa Miyoshi, we tried assimilating precipitation observations with a, a LTKF a, a speedy uh, doing an optimum observing system simulation experiment. So we run the a nature run with a speedy model, which is a, a fairly realistic uh, but uh, fast model. And, and uh, then we took op 
observations and the data assimilation and we tried to assimilate precipitation and it didn't work. So uh, we, we thought uh, precipitation, uh, the problem is precipitation is very non-Gaussian and, and uh, actually uh, the ensemble common filter requires for the observations to have uh, Gaussian errors, but uh, in the precipitation itself is very non-Gaussian. So we tried the Gaussian transformation of precipitation and it worked very nicely. So what we did was to, for each grid point, we, we plotted the histogram of the precipitation, which has a lot of zeros, uh, and then it, it is uh, like, like this. And then we computed, uh, we, we took the, the, the uh, 62 percent of, of the observations were zero for this grid point. So we uh, took the, the CDF, the cumulative probability distribution, and then used the, uh, the, the error function the, uh, in, I forget the word, and, and something transformation and transformed it into a cumulative probability distribution where 60 percent is represented by this and we, we just took the median of that, that zero precipitation and, and put it here in the, and, and the rest is the uh, Gaussian uh, corresponding CDF to this. And, and this, uh, uh, if we go back to, to the PDF, gives us a, a, a nice a <coughs> Gaussian distribution plus the, 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 the zero. And so we, we tried this and, and we did experiments in which we had Ray Winsons and uh, then we, we uh, uh, in which we assimilated only uh, Ray Winsons and Ray Winsons have UVT, the standard variables, uh, uh, sonar meridional velocity, temperature and, and moisture and we got the, the black line uh, which, uh, which represents the error and then we, we assimilated uh, this Gaussian uh, uh, distribution of, of uh, so we, we didn't assimilate the, the original precipitation but it's transformed we transformed it both for the observations and the model and, and uh, uh, applied LTKF and we got uh, this very large improvement. And what was amazing is that the forecast errors uh, over five days remembered very well the, the fact that we, we assimilated the precipitation. Normally what happens is, is the analysis is smaller <coughs> in, in, in all the operational assimilation of precipitation, the analysis is, uh, uh, the initial condition has a smaller error, but it immediately goes back to, to this. But this didn't happen. So the, the fact, and if we only assimilate Q, we, we get, using this potent LTKF, we get a, a substantial improvement, but not much less. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll skip this, and we've, we wish we showed that, that we could both assimilate rain and no rain, which is normally not done. Uh, usually they assimilate only rain, but not, not rain, which is a very accurate <laughs> observation. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip this. Okay, uh, I think uh, I started a quarter to five minutes. Okay. So, let, uh, this is perhaps one, the most, one very exciting uh, result. Uh, NSEP, the, the National Weather Service of the US, occasionally has some horrible forecasts uh, that, that are horrible compared to, to ECMWF. No. And this shows uh, uh, a comp do, this shows this selected subset of, of, of cases in which they say 
it's a, a, a skill dropout, the, that the NCEP system skill dropped down and it shows, uh, it shows the, 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 in blue, the correlation in the five-day forecast of ECMWF and in black the, the, fork, the forecast from NCEP and here you have another one. Uh, it doesn't happen every day by any means. So, and, uh, and you get that occasionally actually the, the NCEP forecast is better than the ECMWF but that's <coughs> normally not like in this case and in this case but generally it's worse and in this in this particular cases it's much worse it's a big gap this between the blue and the black and what uh, they uh, somebody very cleverly uh, tested is the question is 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 the model worse of attention or is it the data simulation worse so what they did was to start from ECMWF analysis initial conditions which have their data simulation and make the forecast and and what they found is is that in that case the NCEP model was completely comparable in skill when it started from ECMWF conditions was even <coughs> bet better sometimes than, than the ECMWF so uh, uh, they they were very worried about what produces these uh, drops in skills and I should say since then, in May last year, they have implemented a hybrid data simulation after many years of saying you should use ensemble common filter, you should use ensemble common filter, they finally combined uh, the ensemble common filter with, with the, the operational system in what they call hybrid. And the number of, of, of uh, these skill dropouts uh, became much, much smaller like like ten percent of what they used to be so uh, in anyway uh, uh, we developed a, a, a we I, I, uh, we developed a method to to estimate the 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 for to estimate what part of uh, so, so let, let's consider this schematic which is uh, due to Langland and Baker in 2004 suppose that you start here uh, and make a forecast and and this is the verification analysis and after uh, one day let's say uh, the error uh, of the forecast after one day started at time zero is this one and if you start uh, six hours earlier you get this error and and the difference is due to the assimilation of the observations in the data assimilation so this is a very complex system, but uh, Langland and Baker managed to, to in, in the uh, variational system, managed to show that one could uh, compute the sensitivity of this forecast to the observe, the f this forecast error, uh, difference in the error, attribute this to each of observation. And then I, I developed a, a, a similar and simpler uh, uh, approach for, for ensemble common filter, which I'm going to skip, but I do have observation e equations occasionally. And, and we, so what, what I wanted to show is, is this very powerful new idea, which is we can use this ability to estimate from a single forecast which improvement or deterioration of the forecast came from which observation. And this was done by uh, Yoichiro Ota. Uh, uh, he, he applied this method to, to a month of, of data with all the observations. And he found that there, was, there were uh, observations which are high latitude uh, 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 winds estimated from satellite data, which uh, gave a, a very large error. And when, when he tested the result by subtracting that data, he, he got an improvement of 39% regionally for that data. So we, this is my, my last slide. So what, what uh, I, uh, the reason I, I was interested in doing this 
regional verification is that we could do a quality control of the observations in a very active way. So we uh, this this an ensemble forecast sensitivity to observations tells tell us what the impact of of the the data was of each piece of data on the 24 hour forecast. So we have uh, after 24 hour forecast this is the original error and in this particular uh, region the 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 modest winds uh, in high high latitudes were uh, had a, a negative impact and, and we could identify that it had a negative impact. So we projected uh, we the this ensemble forecast sensitivity to observations says if you take away those that particular set of observations uh, in this uh, you, you the forecast error will change by this and when we actually took it out it changed by this so it's it's a very similar thing and that clearly improved this because it's opposite to this so uh, uh, the withdrawal the withdrawal of these winds reduced the forecast errors by 39% as, as, as projected. So my dream is to apply this operationally because we can, during the operations, we can make short range forecast, identify bad observations, which otherwise you cannot I identify with this method, and then take them out from the system and, and rerun it without the bad observations. And in addition, we can put all the bad observations in a, in a bucket with all the additional metadata and the creators of the algorithms that develop these observations can use all that uh, in unbelievably rich information to find what went wrong and how to correct that. So that, that's uh, my, my last slide.